So thank you, Emmanuel, and um, thank you to the organizers for giving, the, giving me the opportunity to be here and talk about carbonate biomineralization in modern microbialites, hoping that we might uh, learn something from uh, actual process, current processes uh, uh, in the past, no? like if we can make an analogy of modern systems into the past. Uh, so I am a biologist, but the work that I'm going to present is highly interdisciplinary at the boundary between chemistry, biology, and geology, and is actually the result of a fruitful collaboration with uh, many people, but more especially with Karim Ben Serrara uh, at the uh, Université Pierre and Marie Curie in Paris, uh, David Moreira at my institute, and I will be working mostly about the PhD work of two students, Estelle Curado, who is already a postdoc, and Aurelien Sagai. So, definitions, what are microbialites? In general, organic sedimentary structures that are formed under the influence of microbial communities, and stromatolites are just a particular kind of microbialites that are laminar at the macro scale, so you can distinguish a layering. So in a sense, microbialites are nothing more than lithified microbial mass. Uh, and they are famous because uh, if you have lithified microbial mass, they can be better preserved in the fossil record, so, uh, and actually uh, the oldest life traces that are really not disputed correspond to microbial communities that are fossilized in the form of stromatolites, uh, dating back to 3.5 billion years old in, in, um, in the Pilbara region in Australia, and you have also uh, in very impressive formations uh, at 2.7 billion years old in, also in Australia. So we know that uh, this type of uh, stromatolites occurred already in the early Archean, but uh, uh, we know that they were really widespread and, and very uh, diverse during the Proterozoic, and they declined this type of structures, they declined in the fossil record at the onset of the Cambrian, and uh, so that today we find this type of uh, structures in a limited amount of settings, you find them in some particular marine environments. Uh, the most famous uh, uh, sites are the Exuma Sound in the Bahamas and the Shark Bay in Australia, so you have heard about those already. But you find also microbialites in a variety of alkaline lakes, uh, such as the Lake Van in Turkey, or uh, Setonda in the Pacific, or Alchichica, and I will be talking uh, mostly about this uh, particular setting. So how, this, uh, how do these structures form? Um, uh, to understand how these structures form, you have to take into account three different components, the hydrochemistry, the microbial communities that sit in this type of structures, and the mineral phases. And actually there are two major processes by which uh, microbialites form today. Uh, one is accretion of mineral particles, uh, this uh, type of process is operating uh, more importantly in marine settings where you have tidal activity and waves, so you have this type of mineral particles. And biology can contribute to this because some organisms, in particular filamentous algae or filamentous cyanobacteria, can trap these particles and aggregate them. So that's one way. But we are more interested in the second type of process that may form microbialites, that is the in situ precipitation of carbonate, that is more important in crater lakes where you don't have uh, these waves, etc., and in uh, apparently in several, uh, in many Precambrian stromatolites. So, uh, uh, to be able to precipitate carbonate in situ locally, you need three things. Yes, that you have biology or not. You need carbonate ions, you need cations, calcium, magnesium, etc. You need nucleation centers. So biology can contribute to, to the three of them, uh, in particular to increase uh, locally the concentration of cations and, nuclei and, and, and to be able to act as nucleation centers by producing exopolymeric substances uh, that chelate this type of cations. 
And biology can also uh, um, cooperate to increase the local uh, carbonate concentration by, uh, because some types of microbial metabolisms will increase the, uh, the pH, uh, the activity, the metabolic activity of some microorganisms, for instance, those that are fixing carbon, and so that they will deviate uh, the dissolution equilibrium of CO2 uh, towards carbonate. So this is what people call uh, an alkalinity engine. And there are several types of metabolisms that are conducive to this alkalinity engine uh, and, then, and then promote precipitation of carbonate. This is oxygenic photosynthesis and oxygenic photosynthesis, but also uh, sulfate reduction. And at the same time, you have other metabolisms, other microbes doing other things that promote dissolution. So the, uh, like aerobic respiration for the, that many heterotrophs, aerobic and anaerobic, by the way, sulfide oxidizers or fermentation. So you have organisms that are fermenting and this uh, decreases the pH in the surrounding medium and will promote dissolution. So the formation, the net formation of uh, carbonates in a given site will depend on the balance of these types of metabolisms. So the, to know how this microbial is formed today, we need to know who is there, so what kind of microbes, what type of metabolism these microbes perform, so, and, and what's their carbonate precipitation potential, what type of biomineralization do they carry, if they carry any. I will be talking about extracellular and intracellular mineralization. And finally, are these microbes or some of them able to fossilize and perhaps produce signatures that we uh, can identify uh, after many years in the, for, in, in the uh, geological record? So those are the questions that we have. And in order to answer, we have applied a variety of approaches uh, going from the molecular and metagenomic analysis of microbial communities, uh, targeting the three domains of life, archaea, bacteria, and eukarya, but also different uh, 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 microscopies, scanning, transmission, electron microscopy, uh, uh, and spectroscopies, and also Raman. Okay. So variety of techniques you will see. So our model system is, as I mentioned before, Lake Alchichica which is an alkaline cratal lake located in an, at altitude uh, 2,300 meters above the sea level in the trans-Mexican volcanic vent, uh, belt here. So it, is, it has pH around nine, so alkaline, as I said. It is magnesium rich, and it, it, uh, this explains that uh, it is hydromagnesite, a hydratic uh, magnesium uh, carbonate that is the uh, dominant phase, mineral phase in these rocks. But you also find aragonite, uh, which is one of the forms of uh, calcium carbonate. So we have been studying this type, these microbialites for a number of years, and we carried out initial uh, molecular diversity analysis uh, using classical tools already uh, based on the amplification, cloning, and sequencing of marker genes that, uh, in particular, ribosomal RNA genes that will um, uh, characterize different types of microbes. Uh, but now we, uh, we have at our disposal much more powerful techniques, sequencing techniques. So we went back uh, to Alchichica, sorry, in, in 2012, and we sampled two particular sites. The northern side, uh, this, this spot here, at different depths down to 15 meters, and then the western side here, which is a particular place because there is some seeping, some fresh water seeping, uh, and so the, the hydro local hydrochemistry is a little bit different. So we, what we did was to carry out uh, a, a metagenomic study. Um, uh, that means we analyze, we are analyzing, it's, not a, it's, a, it's a work in progress, the genomes of the whole microbial community all at once. So you do that by extracting the DNA of the microbes that are associated to the rock, which is not easy, but you can do it. And then you can directly sequence the DNA that is contained 
uh, in this community DNA by using high throughput techniques. If you're interested, we use uh, pair and uh, Illumina sequencing and we could obtain, uh, per sample, several million sequences, around 100 million sequences just per sample. And from this huge amount of sequences, you can do many things, but essentially two, you can mine, you can look for marker genes that will tell you what type of microbes are in the community and can inform you about the microbial diversity that is in there. And you can also look for genes that uh, code for proteins that make particular functions. So, so you can have some functional insight on the activities of the community. So I'm going to talk more on the diversity side. Just to say that if you look at the distribution of marker genes, ribosomal RNA genes, belonging to the three domains of life, uh, what you see is this kind of uh, histograms, uh, this distribution. So the three mm, bars here uh, correspond to, three, uh, to three, three replicate samples from the western side. And here you have uh, the corresponding uh, distributions of uh, genes at 1, 5, 10, and 15 meters in the northern side. And what you see here is that these communities are dominated by bacteria in, in orange. So you have between 5 and perhaps 15% of eukaryotes, and archaea are just minor components, less than 1%. So most of it is bacteria. But the communities are highly diverse. Even if you have only 5 to 10% eukaryotes, you find uh, uh, virtually all the known groups of eukaryotes there. I'm um, not going to enter into the names, but in any case, these communities are uh, dominated by photosynthetic eukaryotes. Um, uh, diatoms, in the case of the western side, that is influenced by freshwater arrival, and uh, green algae, chlorophytes, in the case of the, um, uh, let's say, more dominant microbialites in the lake. Okay. We then looked for the diversity of bacteria, and they are highly diverse, in addition to abundant. Many different groups, but mo the most important, the gamma al alpha proteobacteria, cyanobacteria, also bacteroidetes, and many other groups. Each of these groups is, uh, again, highly diverse when you zoom in with many, many operational taxonomic units, which are proxies for species, so several hundreds more than 1,000 species in these uh, samples. And because cyanobacteria are thought to be particularly important players in, the, in microbial light formation, we uh, looked with more detail within the diversity of cyanobacteria. And what we saw is that there is a gradient that, uh, in, in surface microbial lights. Uh, these structures are dominated by filamentous oscillatorialis, which are benthic cyanobacteria, whereas uh, there is a progressive increase in, uh, of uh, this type of cyanobacteria belonging to the order of pleurocapsalids, which are endolytic cyanobacteria, that increase with that. So now uh, I told you that there are several metabolisms that promote carbonate precipitation in principle. We look for microorganisms or genes and uh, uh, belonging to those type of uh, metabolisms in our data set. And the thing is that um, uh, what you have here, um, between 15 and 40% of all the sequences that we got correspond to these organisms that have a potential for carbonate precipitation. So this means that most of the microbial community do not promote precipitation, okay? But if you look into this proportion, then you see that even if cyanobacteria always take an important part here in blue, there are other types of microbes that all are also potentially uh, contributing to carbonate precipitation apart from cyanobacteria, so against the classical uh, idea. And these include photosynthetic eukaryotes, but also anoxygenic phototrophs, and in some cases, also sulfate reducers. In any case, these are just potential uh, for uh, producing carbonates, but do they really do it? or? how can we identify really if these microbes are, are promoting carbonate precipitation 
in biofilms that are extremely complex. So this is a confocal uh, image of, uh, of, of a biofilm associated to these microbialites. So you are here looking at the autofluorescence of phototrophic organisms. You see some cyanobacteria, diatoms here uh, with these little frustals. So how to identify organisms that do really produce biominerals here and uh, do they exist? So I will show you one clear example of microorganisms that do promote carbonate precipitation. And these are cyanobacteria belonging to the order Pleurocapsales that produce extracellular uh, carbonate. So uh, here you have several pictures like microscopy, but also confocal images of these Pleurocapsa-like uh, cyanobacteria. They are present in all the microbialites. They are endolytic, really living within the rock, and they are dominant in deep microbialites. Uh, when you see them under confocal um, uh, microscopy, uh, you see it uh, and you stain them with calcium that shows where calci available calcium is. Then you see that calcium in green is uh, very often associated to the external mucilage of this pleurocapsales. So you can show that there is a specific association of aragonite with this type of cyanobacteria. So here you have a confocal picture where you see a colony of these pleurocapsa-like uh, organisms. And then when you superimpose a Raman uh, spectra or Raman uh, 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 analysis on that, you see in red the area corresponding to aragonite, which is not the dominant form uh, uh, carbonate in the, uh, in the rock, uh, as compared to hydromagnesite. And it's really coincident. So in order to go further, and see whether it was really uh, a close association. What we did was to uh, cut a fragment of the microbialite, embed it in a resin, and then uh, made thin slices and looked that under scanning electron microscopy. And then you have this type of image where the lighter areas correspond to aragonite, and then this corresponds to hydromagnesite, and the biofilm is much darker. So you can color that artificially so that, that you can see better. So the, really the organic matter that is associated to living cell is in green here, these areas. This is the aragonite and this is the hydromagnesite that is uh, the bulk of the rock. So you can now look and, and, and really target particular areas within these uh, thin slices. And you sup if you superimpose uh, scanning electron microscopes showing the mineral distribution here of aragonite, you see that, uh, and confocal microscopy, you see that the, uh, these type of colonies of pleurocapsa are really within, um, uh, embedded within the, the mineral phase. So that is one thing. But in some places, you see, uh, you can see gradients of uh, fossilization gradients such as here. So here, this is another area, and here in dark, you have the cells, okay? This is organic matter. And at some point, you see that some of these cells get encrusted by these lighter areas. And as you go f uh, forward within the, the, the rock, you see that some of these spaces, some the lumen is being filled by crystals. And at the end, you end up with some kind of pavement uh, that were presumably ancient cells. So there is a kind of fossilization gradient along this uh, line. And um, you, you can do uh, further analysis by, for instance, cutting thin slices using focused ion beams. So you, cut a th you can cut a thin slice across a cell, an encrusted cell. And then you can analyze that by scanning transmission X-ray microscopy that at the carbon KH that will inform you about the chemical surrounding of carbon. And you can get uh, a spectra here in red of the carbonate, the inorganic carbon, and in green, uh, this corresponds to the spectrum of organic matter, different types of organic matter. And actually, you see that the cells or the remains of cells are still containing a lot of organic matter, and they are embedded in the carbonate matrix. And you can do the same further in uh, within the, the, the microbialite, and you see that you still some can see some cells, but uh, mostly what happens is that everything is occupied by carbonate and the organic matter diffuses uh, uh, in, in the carbonate. 
So you can go further and study uh, by uh, transmission uh, electron microscopy uh, these cells. Actually, this is that particular one here. And um, what you see is that there are two types of crystals. There are small rods here of aragonite. I don't know if you see them well, they're filiform crystals. And then very big crystals that are massive here. So the idea is that there is kind of fossilization pattern as follows. So you have cells that are purely organic. They begin to uh, uh, somehow promote carbonate precipitation in the form of aragonite around the cell. The cell becomes encrusted and then dies. And then the interior of the cell is filled by these bigger crystals that are another form of uh, uh, carbon, uh, the aragonite crystals. So this might perhaps constitute a potential biosignature, but we don't know. Perhaps it's, uh, it needs further study. Uh, but the, the, another question is this, this interaction that we have seen at micro scale, does it occur at macro scale? Can, can we see an effect? And actually, yes, we can. We can show that there is a, a very uh, strong association between pleurocapsules and, and aragonite, and ma uh, aragonite at macro scale. So when you do multivariate statistics of the um, um, diversity of cyanobacteria, and the composition of microbial lights, you see a strong correlation between pleurocapsalis, but also crococalis, suggesting that they might also be involved, and calcium, which is uh, uh, the, uh, uh, an aragonite is the only uh, mineral having calcium in this system. So there is a strong correlation, and it is likely a causal effect. So I have been talking so far of extracellular carbonate precipitation, but we also detected cyanobacteria that do perform intracellular or, or make intracellular carbonates, and we enrich actually one of those, and you have picture here. We knew that it was a cyanobacterium because it had the pigments typical of cyanobacteria, you call it the chlorophyll. And also we analyzed the composition of these internal uh, crystals and we showed that they were amorphous and enriched in, cal in calcium, magnesium, strontium, and barium, suggesting that these organisms concentrate um, strontium and barium. Um, this uh, cyanobacterium that we call Gleomargarita litophora, because uh, it's, uh, well, uh, uh, we sequenced the 16S ribosomal RNA gene for this organism, and it uh, branches relatively early in the phylogenetic tree of cyanobacteria. But we also isolated a second one uh, that made carbonates this time at the cell poles here, and then we call it uh, Cinecococcus calcipolaris. So you see the carbonates in red, and these in green are correspond to polyphosphate inclusions. Many cyanobacteria do that. So because we detected these forms of intracellular carbonate precipitation, we wonder if uh, this type of intracellular precipitation had escaped previous researchers. So we um, screen um, uh, a variety of cyanobacteria that you see here in a phylogenetic tree, uh, um, encompassing a wide, uh, a wide distribution of cyanobacteria across the whole uh, phylum that uh, are deposited in the uh, Pasteur Institute collection, looking for intracellular carbonates. And actually, we detected, uh, we detected uh, two types of uh, patterns. One that is uh, uh, like uh, the one in Gleomargarita litophora with uh, uh, carbonates uh, scattered in the cytoplasm, and you have it, it here in organisms labeled in red in the tree. And then we also detected a group, a particular group this type, so this is a synapomorphy for the specialists for the group, um, that form carbonates at the cell poles, and we think that it has a link, this type of pattern has a link with cell division. So this type of, uh, because this type of cyanobacteria tend to cluster towards the, the, the basal part of the cyanobacterial tree, um, this opens a, an interesting question and perhaps a hypothesis, and it is that perhaps this can uh, um, suggest an alternative explanation for the Precambian enigma. 
So the Precambrian enigma is something very simple, which is the, the fact that we know that cyanobacteria must have evolved before oxygen started to accumulate in the atmosphere 2.4 billion years ago, well before, but the oldest bona fide microfossils of cyanobacteria that form because some of these cyanobacteria encrust, so they give the morphology, uh, appear much later. So at least one billion year later in the fossil record, or maybe only at 700 million years ago. So if the first cyanobacteria were not able to export alkalinity outside the cell and did make uh, carbonates only intracellularly, then you could not have uh, uh, extracellular precipitation and you could not preserve the, the shape of these uh, cells. So that's, uh, of course, highly speculative at, the, at this time if you want, but it is an alternative explanation. So in summary, um, living microbialites are formed by a wide variety of microorganisms, some of which can potentially uh, promote carbonate precipitation, but most don't, so highly complex communities. Some of these organisms perform extracellular uh, mineralization, perhaps leaving uh, some potential biosignatures, but in any case there is a bias because only a subfraction of the microbialites, the microorganisms living in a, uh, in a microbialite will leave signatures for the fossil record. And finally, there are also some intracellular precipitation processes, and we don't know yet what is the contribution of them, but maybe it was uh, important in the past. And with that, I thank you for your attention, and I'm ready to take questions. Thank you.